to look at this applicant for who she was. She said, I'm going to go into the field of thanatology. And I said, great. So first, we try to maintain him in there. There were reimagined view. In child development, it doesn't happen. Part, though, is with that hose that runs from Steelers. Who take too many children, or? Bang woman who, months before, the agency said, when my client picked up the phone that morning, I knew that the call wasn't going to go well. She sounded calm, a little bit anxious, which was unsurprising given the fact that we were appealing the termination of her parental rights. But I didn't expect her to be this calm. For three days before this phone call, I got a call from the prosecuting attorney on the case to let me know that my client's child had died in foster care. He died due to medical complications. He was sick throughout his time in care, um, but we didn't know why he passed away. The prosecutor assured me that the foster care workers would immediately call the mother to tell her the news and suggested I wait a couple of days before I reach out to her as her appellate lawyer to talk over what this meant for her case. But just then, at that moment on the phone, I realized that she didn't know. So I paused, unsure of whether she infected or did not know, and I expressed sorrow for her loss. And then there was silence that seemed to last for minutes. She said, what, what are you talking about? What, what loss? I don't know um, what, uh, what you're referring to. And that was the moment I realized that no one had told her. So I shared the news with her at that moment. And I heard uh, what seemed to be minutes and minutes of screaming on the phone, sort of primal wailing, which still rings in my ears to this day. And I hung up the phone after sharing the news with her, uh, and I went over to the couch in my office, and I put my hands on my head uh, and wept. And I questioned what I was doing in a system that didn't have the compassion or the decency to share this news that a mother's child had passed away immediately with the person who would care for her the most. That moment was kind of an awakening for me to start paying attention, right? Start thinking about compassion and how compassionate our system was, to start noticing whether we as a system were missing these moments where people were suffering and we were walking by them. And what I saw was disheartening. I saw a case involving a mom whose husband of many years suddenly passed away due to a heart attack, and she started drinking as a result of that. But all the child welfare system could ask is, why are you drinking? Why don't you stop drinking? And at no point did anyone actually put a hand on her shoulder and say, I am sorry for your loss. I saw a case involving a human trafficking victim who had been trafficked for years as a teenager forcibly. Um, put in all sorts of situations against her will and started using heroin as a result of that. And when the case entered the child welfare system, rather than express any sorrow, any grief as to this pain that this mother had endured for so many years, we blamed her for her heroin addiction. I saw it in myself as a lawyer representing parents in the child welfare system. And I can think of one case vividly where we had a client who was homeless who could not provide a home for his child, uh, and as a result, his children entered foster care. And I, as the lawyer, was so concerned about solving the legal complexities of the case and getting from one stage to the next that I ignored the pain that this man was experiencing of being a parent who couldn't provide a home for his child. And so one day in our office, while I was trying to get him to admit that he couldn't do this, he looked me in the eye and said, how dare you, sir, accuse me of doing something that I want to do. And he challenged me at that moment to say, what would you have done in that situation? Can you not see that I am in pain right now? Our law mandates that we make reasonable efforts to reunify children and our families in the child welfare system. But one of the things that I'm here to persuade you of is that without compassion, without recognizing the humanity of every single person who walks into our system, we will never reach the potential of our system. That com compassion has to be the foundation for every single effort that we make to support families and bring kids back home to live safely with their families. It is the right thing to do. 
is a thing that preserves the dignity of each family that we represent, and it is truly in the best interest of children. But more than that, if I haven't convinced you in terms of just the, sh the sheer humanity of this, uh, of this act, the evidence backs it up. If you look at the research in, in the medical field, uh, medical research has shown consistently that compassion increases patient satisfaction, it reduces anxiety, it gets patients to comply with treatment, and it increase, increases overall health and well-being in study after study after study. One study of 1,400 patients who, were te who had tested positive for HIV uh, looked at the impact of compassion and outcomes. And the study measured a simple question that they asked of patients. Does your doctor know you as a person? And when patients said yes on all four of those measures, on satisfaction, anxiety, well-being, and, uh, and administering, following treatment, the results were significantly better when patients felt that they, they were understood as a person. Another study looked at uh, videos of doctor-patient relationships and uh, looked for empathetic moments and saw how doctors responded to those moments. And they found that when doctors recognized those moments that patients were suffering and actually responded to them, again, on those four measures, results improved significantly. Study after study after study exists that not only does compassion improve outcomes for the families that we serve, it actually makes us better. It makes us better because it reduces burnout, it keeps us connected to the work that we do, and it improves our decision making. It makes us more careful. It makes us better at the job that we do. But not only that, compassion actually doesn't take that much time. Again, looking at the medical field, uh, numerous studies show that even short interventions of 30 seconds to a minute, simply asking a, que a question of a patient, like, how are you doing today? What can I do to help? Dramatically impacts uh, outcomes because it conveys to the patients that we care, that we value them as human beings, that we care about their dignity, that we are in kinship with them, um, that there's no us and them, we're all in this together. So how might this look for our work in child welfare? Right? How do we incorporate these principles uh, and, uh, and incorporate principles of compassion into the work that we do? Um, I would suggest to start three things for us to focus on. First, we need to notice when people are in pain. In the everyday busyness of our lives, in busy court dockets, high caseloads, technology distracting us, uh, we like to sort of hang out with our own often in court systems. The lawyers talk to the lawyers, the judges talk to their staff. Um, we often don't take the time um, to sit with clients and sit with them and hear them and listen to them. We need to change that dynamic. We need to notice pain when it exists, um, for that is the first step of compassion. Second, we need to acknowledge when someone is in pain. We need to acknowledge for that mother who relapsed because she lost her husband that she experienced a loss. It could be simply saying something like, I'm sorry for your loss, but we have to signify to the families that we work with that we care about them as human beings. Think of them as our neighbors, as our family members, as our friends. It's again that sort of mutuality and that kinship that's gonna bring our system together. There can no longer be an us versus them if we truly wanna be a compassionate child welfare system. And third, and this is perhaps the most important part of compassion, is that we need to act. That compassion requires more than just noticing and acknowledging. It means doing something to show uh, that you care about a human being. Acting can take many different forms. It could be witnessing and asking them, uh, and, uh, a client, about their story and ask them really to, to tell us what they went through, what they experienced, how they feel. It could be if you're a lawyer, uh, bringing forward to the court a motion or a request or just telling the client's story to make sure that their, their, their pain is understood and heard by all. It could be taking them to a visit, to go see a service provider, um, to go uh, to a church community 
uh, to go do something to show again that you care about this individual. You care about this client as a human being because that is what compassion requires. I want to end with a story that to me indicates the powerful transformation that compassion can have on our child welfare system. Uh, and it's a story that happened uh, about five years ago or so during a release of parental rights, which for me is one of the most difficult experiences uh, to sit through. As a parent of three children, I can think of no decision that a, that a parent makes that is more difficult than releasing the rights to the most important thing in their life. And so on this day, I represented uh, uh, these children. Their mother was incarcerated. Uh, and so she walked into court. Um, she was releasing her rights because she was going to be incarcerated for a long period of time. Children were living safely with her parents in Florida who wanted to adopt these children. And so uh, the mother walked into court. Uh, her hands were, uh, were cuffed. Um, the judge uh, looked at her and was kind of doing his advice of rights. And everybody in the courtroom was um, upset. The mother was in tears, again, giving up the most important thing in her life, her children, uh, with whom she had a very close bond. Her parents in the back of the courtroom, who had traveled from Florida, uh, were in tears. Um, again, I can think of nothing more difficult for a grandparent than to watch their own child have to give up uh, their parental rights. Uh, and the judge uh, was upset because he was sensitive to what was going on. So he did the advice of rights. Uh, he looked in the back of the courtroom and saw that the grandparents were visibly upset. So this judge left the bench because the hearing had sort of formally concluded, went up to the grandparents and asked them, uh, or at least acknowledged, first he noticed and acknowledged that they were in pain and, and acknowledged it by saying, I see that this is an incredibly difficult day for you. And then he asked the question that I think can transform child welfare, a simple but powerful question of, is there any way or anything I can do right now to help? And the grandparents were caught off guard a little bit. They were, they were wasn't expecting a question like that to come from a judge uh, about how the judge can help them. And they said, yes, Your Honor, there is, in the middle of their, of their tears. Uh, they said that their daughter has been incarcerated for 15 months. And while they've been able to talk to her on the phone and have visit her behind a, gl a glass, they have not been able to hug their daughter in the time that, uh, that she's been incarcerated. And they'd like that opportunity right now in court to do it. So the judge looked over at the corrections officers who had sort of the, the, the puzzled bureaucratic look on their face. And he said, would that be OK? And would you uncuff her to let them have this, um, this embrace? And they sort of hustled, and they talked, and they violated all their protocols about safety, even though it was a nonviolent offense. Uh, and finally, uh, with the pressure of the judge, they relented. And they said, yes, we'll allow this to happen. And so they uh, uncuffed the mother. The grandparents entered the, uh, the, the main part of the courtroom where the mother was sitting. And we all watched as the grandmother and the grandfather embraced their daughter for the first time in 15 months. And in that moment, you look around the courtroom, the judge was in tears. We were in tears. Even the correction officers were in tears about the, the powerfulness of this moment. And at that very moment, I felt for the first time in a long time in child welfare that we were all in this together. That there was kinship, there was relationship. We just felt like we were part of something greater than this case. And that to me is the powerful impact that compassion can have on transforming the child welfare system. Thank you. Native Americans in the United States actually live on a multi